Right, okay, we'll kick off now. Thank you very much for joining us today, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is our first keynote discussion topic of the three days of the show. Each day, we're going to cover a particular different topic with regards to working at height. And um, our intention is we're, we're going to deal with some issues much broader than just particular product issues. We're going to deal with issues that surround the whole area of how on earth we can improve um, working at height safety and reduce incidents and accidents when working thereof. The first one we want, we want to kick off with today is really starting probably at the, at the start of the process with regards to anything to do with working at height and that's to deal with the issue really of the planning and designing of any particular project that involves working at height activity. So what we've done today, we've got together four leading organisations here to represent themselves and really talk about this discussion because each of these four companies, organisations you'll see here are all specialists in their particular um, areas. So starting from the far end, we have Peter Caperhorn representing REBA, the Royal Institute for British Architects. Next in we have Tony Baker, who Tony is here representing the Royal Institute for Chartered Surveyors. I have to remember all these acronyms to make sure I get them right. <laughs> Then we have Richard. Richard is here from APS, oh. Richard Habgood. Richard is President-Elect of the Association for Project Safety, which is heavily involved with CDM, CDMC's organisations. And finally, we have Ray Johnson from Safety and Access, representing Access Industry Forum. In and Ray is here, I guess, representing in terms of specialist oh. contractor and right down at the face in terms of actually carrying out the work and at height. So first of all, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for being here. Um, I just really wanted to kick off and sort of, you know, the HSC have done a lot in the press recently about identifying that in terms of in increasing um, reductions in accidents for working at height, the planning and design process is an important area to focus on. And um, I thought, Ray, maybe if I can come to you first, yeah. and I can talk to you maybe first off, maybe of some of the challenges you see or some of the problems that we have right now in where you see naturally a sort of design and uh, planning has really sort of failed to sort of accurately work. One of the best examples of that is um, some recent surveys we've been carrying out set to work at height regulations and in particular with work on, on roofs and I'm talking about high rise roofs here, particularly on local authorities, maybe on local colleges. And one of the things that we found when we were doing these is lots of people work on roofs now of tall buildings. We have the mobile phone companies going up there. We have aerial companies going up there. People need to go up on top of these roofs for maintenance. And what we found with a lot of these surveys that we were doing, we get on the top of a 16-storey building. It's got an asphalt roof, and the upstand on the side of the roof is about two inches, and they're expected to clean all the gutters out 16 floors up. Now, that work at height is just not on. So that's the worst case scenario. A better case scenario is somebody's thought right at the end of the construction process, whoops, we better think about the maintenance. I know, we'll install a safety line all the way around. Well, that's fine, as long as somebody has got a harness, knows about it. Do they know it needs to be inspected? If you put a harness up for the life, uh, sorry, a safety line up, for the life of build the building, you'll probably have to replace that about seven or eight times. And also, it is personal protection. It's not collective protection. So one of the things I would like to ask uh, the other members of the panel, really, is what do you think we can do about the design of a building that even now doesn't consider how, A, we build a building, but more importantly, mm. how we maintain a building safely from a place of work at height? Can I pass it over to anybody else? To well, Ray, Ray let, let, me, um, let, me, let me run through some of the other gentlemen first before you take over. Um, Peter, if I can come to you, maybe from the other end of the whole um, process and right from the design stage of the process. I guess um, designers, architects might well argue that in fact their role is really to be creative, to develop, to be innovative in, in design and really take that design process forward. And arguably, you might say, architects will then turn around and say, well, work and art is far, far too far down the process. Hmm for really us to worry about, and, and really, you know, that is for further down the chain for them to resolve. Well, the th thing is, Neil, um, I, you're, you're right to some degree, but I, but I would also say that, that 
uh, designing and construction of buildings these days is very common. So once you move out to uh, commercial, once you move out of the domestic sector, um, commercial sector involves a lot of people, and it involves a lot of not working. Okay, I'm used to talking amongst myself, so that was fine. Um, what I was saying was, in the domestic sector, then things are a great deal simpler than in the commercial sector where you've got a lot of people involved. Having said that, these days, under CDM regs, mm. under the building regs, arguably, we should be allowing for the maintenance and safe repair of all buildings, in fact. There are a lot of buildings now that do have built-in and permanent balustrading around the, uh, around the top of the roof, as, as you've uh, alluded to. Um, but there are too many where, uh, actually, it's left to chance. And I think we've all collectively got to do a lot more about that. And that's one of the reasons why certainly we're, we're all involved in ongoing conversations. Um, to try and get everybody, it stems straight from clients and then runs all the way through the whole production process. Um, and in particular, a problem we face is a thing called value engineering, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, which is probably n neither value nor engineering. It's basically a good reason <laughs> for reducing costs. And one of the things that happens there is a lot of the good work that goes in early on actually gets taken out because it's somebody else's problem. And um, we just heard how that, that happens. People turn up and the things that were originally envisaged just aren't there. So maybe that's enough for me for the moment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Richard, if I can come to you. Richard, your, your role is, um, your organisation are, are primarily about CDMs and CDMCs. And obviously, I guess your role is very much, you're, you're the liaison between, I guess, effectively, the architect, designer, pl planner, main client, um, and the specialist organisations. And um, some of maybe what Ray has seen earlier and acknowledging what, what Peter says in terms of recognising that, but then when the value engineering comes, it's stripped out and it opens up its own challenges in itself. That's got to be quite a, a hard role for, for you guys actually to, to manage effectively, is it not? Uh, yes, Neil, you're, you're quite right. Um, as a practicing CDM coordinator, one of the hardest jobs that any uh, person involved uh, doing the work that uh, we do, and I do in particular, is actually uh, getting everybody involved, that's the duty holders, to accept responsibility for their actions. It is fair to say that uh, nowhere in the work at height regulations does it actually place a duty on a designer to consider uh, the implications. The CDM regulations do. They're quite clear. Uh, regulation 11, uh, subsections 3 and 4, etc. But I'm not here to quote uh, the regulations to everybody. But what Ray is saying and what Peter is saying are in are typical and very common problems. A CDM coordinator can fight his corner, but too often the client, unfortunately, listens to arguments relating to cost and is prepared to pass on the problem to someone else. What disturbs me greatly is that very often in the process of a building construction project, there may be a developer involved, and there is a contractor involved, and there is a design team involved. But at the end of the construction phase, the developer or the promoter of the construction project actually sells or passes on the problems of maintenance and other works to the end user of that building. Now, that may apply in, cons in commercial projects, but if you think about domestic dwellings for sale, that's exactly what a house builder does. He passes on the problems for maintaining structures, working at height. I know you may say that they don't apply to domestic dwellings, and they don't under the CDM rates, but there's a responsibility, and it comes back to what I'm saying. The designers have to think about maintaining <laughs> structures and not listen to the arguments of cost or I should say the promoter or the developer must not listen to arguments of cost because he, he too, under regulations, has a responsibility. Okay, thank you, Richard. Tony, cost, 
right. and chartered surveyors. That's, yes. um, right. that's something that generally goes quite hand in hand. Okay. Yeah. How, do you respond? How, how, how I would look at things is, is starting really from the technical side of things, looking at what regulations there are, building regulations, workplace regulations. So if, if we go back to the example of the flat roof, um, the old workplace regulations, regulation 13.1, address the issues relating to perimeter fencing on roofs. And basically, if you required regular access onto a roof, then you'd have to have perimeter fencing. If there's no access requirement, so maybe with an asphalt roof, the life anticipation would be, say, 40 years without much requirement to go up on that roof to carry out repairs. So it would have been quite legitimate for the designers to design that roof without edge protection. Now, as um, we, we, we've heard earlier, the requirement now generally seems to be for more plant and equipment to be placed on roofs, so whether it's um, satellite dishes, telecoms, communications um, equipment, um, air conditioning equipment, etc., etc. So once you actually place equipment on the roof and there is a regular requirement to access that roof, then you need to consider the work at high rates. Um, so whilst in the past there might have been good um, basis for not providing edge protection, with, with modern requirements um, then you do require access. But that brings other issues into account as well. So um, if you've got a building, who's allowed onto the roof? How do you manage access onto the roof? Um, and um, when, when, when I started out, most of the roofs, you, you, you either had two choices. They continued the staircase up onto the roof and they put a brick structure on the roof so you had an access door out onto the roof. Or you, you had a hatch and you had to climb up a ladder or a cat ladder or step ladder to get onto the roof. Now, if you're going to provide permanent access, then you've got to look at other issues such as do you provide a permanent staircase up onto the roof? If you do, how do you manage access? So you, you might have um, systems where you, you, you've got mesh fencing with a keypad so that you actually stop um, unauthorised people getting onto the roof. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, interesting. Peter, you, you look like I, you might come in there. I'd like to come in there, yeah, because um, obviously we're in an age where sustainability is really important and so another whole aspect to this is that really going forward any roof should be used as a resource for energy water um, that sort of that sort of stuff so we're going to see an awful lot more buildings with photovoltaics with with hot water solar installations um, with green roofs with all sorts of stuff that means that uh, basically access will be required more and more so to, to take a fairly loose attitude towards the safety of access and maintenance and repair um, is just going to not be acceptable in future, I believe. No. Okay. Um, I'd like to move on now because one of the things that um, the Access Industry Forum are, are aware of is, is a British standard that's now been developed. Um, I, I have a draft of it here and, and I'll read you the title. It's called BS8560. It's in draft at the moment but it's called the Code of Practice for the Strategic Design of Buildings and Structures Incorporating Safe Working at Height. Um, interesting, interesting, it's sort of all linked into the sort of same subject we're talking about here. Um, Tony, I know you've been heavily involved in the development of the British Standard. Could you maybe just spend a, a minute just describing really more in detail what, what this British Standard is aimed at and really how <coughs> is it going to affect the relevant parts of the process? Right, okay. What, what, what it's doing is not dictating to designers, you know, you should be doing this or you should be doing that, but really trying to get designers to consider what the various options are, because more often than not, there's not one simple solution. So if you've got a tall building, um, you might be using cradles, to come down the building, you might be using cherry pickers to get up to second, third floors, 
or uh, if you're at ground floor level, if you're cleaning windows, you might have one of those long extendable poles. So um, what the British standard is really trying to elicit from designers is, is what are the matters that they need to consider and what options are available. So you, you, you might come up with two or three different options for the same building. Um, as buildings get higher, then there is obviously a need for more fixed access equipment, so cradles and robotic um, machinery, etc., etc. So um, the, the, there's a whole array of tools and equipment available out there, and hopefully, design, with, with this new bridge standard, it will uh, give designers a tool to enable them to look at these okay. various options. Okay. But, but are you then, then saying that basically you're putting responsibility onto designers in terms of selection of equipment for that building? Right. Because sure, surely, I mean, Richard come in there, I mean, that, that is... Well, that the, is the, you know, I think, think the important thing is that um, there are um, limits to a designer's knowledge about the specialist equipment. And hopefully one of the things that will um, come about because of the new British standard is that the experts will be brought in at an earlier stage in the design. Because, okay. say, say for example, you've got cradles. Now, um, if you've got a very tall building and you, you've got a very large cradle, then the, the loads that are imposed upon the roof structure is it, not only the dead load of the, the actual cradle, it, it, it's the, the, the wind loads and dynamic loads when it's in operation. Now, if that, if that is designed in too late, then you might have to redesign the structure okay. so that you can transmit that load down. Okay. So it, it is important that um, these aspects are considered early on. Okay. Richard, com coming back down in terms of, you know, your association is going to be the one that's going to have to sort of work with this bridge stand as well and, and be the go-between between the two. Do you see this as a step forward or...? Yes, the, uh, the new Brit or the proposed British standard is indeed good news, but it still comes back to as to whether or not uh, designers will in fact um, obey this British standard. Uh, I'd like to actually introduce something uh, into this uh, discussion that is associated with the whole subject matter of this morning's debate, and that is competence levels. Competency is a key issue in, con in construction work and maintaining structures. But going back to the initial issue on um, the work that a designer can do, he may not know anything about the plant and equipment per se, because that is specialist knowledge that is being installed, but he can have an influence on where that plant and equipment is being positioned. It need not necessarily be at high level. Air handling units work can work equally as well in a farm at ground floor level as they can indeed work at high level on a flat roof. But it's very, very much easier to maintain plant and equipment working at ground level than it is getting up onto a roof. As I said before, there is a tendency to pass the problem on. Pass the problem on to the end user or, uh, of the building. And this is a concern. And as an organization that does represent uh, the largest number of um, CDM coordinators in the UK, all that a CDM co coordinator can do is, shall we say, uh, present for the health and safety file and building operation and maintenance purposes, a list of the residual hazards arising from the completion of the construction project for the manager or the planner of the maintenance to pick up and incorporate into his management of the problems that, or the hazards that remain in the design. Okay. Ray, from a, a sort of working practice point of view, um, you obviously heard there's a British standard coming along that may well help inform designers more, but, but also, I mean, you know, it's very easy to sensationalise this as well, but I guess there are 
good examples already that are working out there in industry today without this British standard being in place. So, I mean, do you have a feel for why sometimes it is working and why sometimes it's not? And, um, you know, whether, whether the British standard is the right answer or, or whether, it's, whether it will make any difference at all? Well, Neil, the British standard is obviously a good starting point. I can, can give you some examples of where the scaffolding industry, for instance, has worked with the timber frame industry. The timber frame industry has, over the past few years, many years, initially had a lot of problems with scaffolding actually falling over when they were building timber frames because the timber frame manufacturers didn't want to provide anchor positions for scaffolding. The scaffolders were told to put the scaffold up without touching the building, which they did. A wind then came along, blew the whole lot down. But since then, the timber frame industry and the scaffolding industry have sat down together. They've thought about it from both sides. The first thing that's come up is every scaffold that goes up for a timber frame building is now specifically designed to take into account that it is difficult to tie to the building. But more importantly, the timber framed industry have come back and accepted that they have to provide tie positions for the temporary structures that are absolutely essential for, for their buildings to go up. The only thing that I would ask is the rest of the design industry take that on board. The biggest problem that we actually have now in scaffolding, that if we're putting up scaffolding against a, a building, we need a tie pattern approximately four meters by four meters. Now most um, stanchion uh, spacings are far greater than four meters. So straight away, we get involved in a very, very complex design for a scaffold because the building designer hasn't given, or it seems to the scaffolding industry, hasn't given any consideration to how something essential like scaffolding to construct it is actually going to be tied. They all turn around and say, not on my building, because it's a curtain walling and you can't tie to it. <laughs> okay, interesting. Now, at this stage, I, I, want, I want to sort of bring the audience in, into this as well, because, you know, um, I, I guess the fact that you're sitting here, you have a particular interest in design. So, I mean, there's, there's four great panelists of experts here. If you have a question, you want to add to the, um, the panelists now, please raise your hand and um, we'll, we'll put a microphone to you. Gentleman over there. Sorry, <laughs> Trevor Fennell, I represent SEMA, um, the permanent access uh, people and suspended access people. I too, like Tony, am sitting on the committee for 8560. We've had a nice discussion about what happens on the roofs and what have you, but also 8560 is starting to look at what happens inside during the construction phase to make sure that the people who are constructing the building have a safe place of work. That's, that's what it's about. Everyone has the right to expect to have a safe place from which to work. And if that's the premise that people start with when they're designing, that colors their judgment on what they should be providing. And very, very cynically, um, I reckon if it was a law passed that the designer had to use the equipment first, then I'm sure some of the equipment we see being used would never be there because they wouldn't get on it. So it really, but it, what does come down to it is thinking about the, 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 the access problems early enough. It's, it's too late to call someone in when the building's six stories up and, oh, we've got a problem. We, we're not quite sure how we're going to do this. We didn't foresee that. I'm sorry, you need to sit down. You need to put something down, a schedule, a plan, and then start and bring, as Tony said, bring the specialists in earlier. Get the design team earlier. Get them to start to work together earlier because it's the tradesmen and the builders and the users of this equipment who know what they need to produce a clean building, a well-serviced building, and that, in actual fact, is in the interests of the building owner, the developer, and the client. Okay, okay. But, but I mean, taking on board that point, and, I, and I, you, you're all eager to, to jump in there, surely the, the, the question that's, that's got to come back to probably yourselves and, and the questionnaire person there as well, is if you involve every single interested party at the design stage of the process, 
you're going to have to hire out the Albert Hall to get all these people in, and, and being the nature of human beings would take forever to come to a decision. I mean, would, would that be a, a fair argument against that? I, I'm just being devil's advocate. Peter? Yeah, it sure would. Um, I think, that firstly, let's just go back on to the British standard for a second. The idea behind that, fundamentally, is to raise this subject early on and to ensure that the guy paying the money, i.e. the client, recognises this whole arena as something that is serious and essential for the building project. Because all too often he gets sidelined. And we then move on to saying, right, um, how do we design safely? I think the problem there is that, again, coming back to commercial buildings, we have an intensely complicated array of designers. I mean, I'm here representing the RIBA, but, you know, it is not, it is not difficult to get upwards of 15 to 20 people in the primary design role um, on the average project these days. So, and everybody plays their part. Going back to your point about the Albert Hall, Neil, you probably would need that if you gave everybody a say. I think the industry is getting better. I think we do have a bit more joined up thinking and all the rest of it. Yeah. But we also do equally have a lot of silos going on at the moment that hmm. need to be broken down so that we can get exactly those points that you mentioned addressed. And probably the final thing to say is that the industry is moving on um, and we are moving on to a more electronic age and some of you might have come, come across building information modelling which the government is pushing hard. Mm. If we move into that arena which they want us to do within the next two or three years you have to resolve the detail very early on otherwise it just doesn't get into the design. So I think we, we also have to acknowledge the, the bad points yeah. but we also to have a little bit of an optimistic view that things are progressing and things are getting better. And that's really what I'd like to flag up, I think. OK, thank, thank you, Peter. I guess also, I mean, it's, it's making sure those rights specialist oh, bodies that are competent are coming to the table as well yeah. to ensure that yeah. develops. Well. Absolutely. Right. I think one of the problems is that during the design process, one of the main goalposts is getting a project through planning. And more often than not at the planning stage, um, a lot of the issues that we would deem to be necessary um, haven't been discussed because the whole focus has been on getting that building through the planning process. So perhaps we could look at things slightly differently where we have another goalpost and that is buildability. Um, and that should go hand in hand and in tandem with the sort of planning process. So when, when you get to the planning stage, you should have a building that is capable of being built. That raises issues such as, um, do you bring the specialist contractors in or is a, a market for um, specialist access consultants to come in at an early stage to provide that advice that is needed? But the implication of that is that someone's got to pay for it. And that, I think, is one of the problems that bedevils our industry, is that, um, by and large, clients don't want to pay at an early stage in the process for, um, for, for advice that they, they actually need. But if, if, if you look at it, um, if you only have to design something once, and you get it right at the beginning, it's actually cheaper. Okay. Couldn't agree more. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Richard, do you want to come uh, Yes, thank you, uh, Neil. Um, the points raised in the last few minutes are most interesting. Today's discussion is entitled Design versus Cost versus Safety. Now, it is very, very important to consider this one fact. If a building, during the course of its construction, costs one pound, in the lifetime of the structure of that building, the end user or the owner and occupier of that building may spend nearly 200 pounds maintaining that structure. It's a frightening ratio. I don't know it precisely, but it's nigh on 200 times the cost of the structure. So, why can't we, 
as an industry, put more into reducing that ratio. We are cost driven because people do not accept their responsibilities. They are not thinking things right the way through. I keep on stressing that point, and I've also mentioned before about competence levels. If they were truly competent in what they were doing, they would be thinking about the whole lifetime. And as Tony has just discussed about buildability, there is another key buzzword in construction, and that's called maintainability. So I, for one, would welcome a greater thought and time given to the design and planning and preparation before construction to reduce the maintainability of a structure. Thank you. Okay. Gentlemen, unfortunately we're out of time and thank you um, audience for participating. Getting interesting. Um, I think it's been a very interesting discussion. It's, it's a shame that we've only had 25 minutes to discuss it in, but all of these gentlemen here are going to be right outside for about the next 10, 15 minutes, probably between themselves resolving all these issues hopefully as well, but also if any of you have any particular discussions or any particular issues or questions you'd like to talk to them, I'm sure they'll be more than happy um, to take those up with you. And uh, I'd just like to thank you all for, for coming along. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Did you watch the panel discussion? Oh, we did, yeah. Yeah, what do you think of it? Excellent. What was your thoughts on the panel discussion? Very good. Yeah, enjoy it? Yeah.